So uh, it is 6.30 p.m. Uh, IST here. Uh, I'm greatly honored to, uh, uh, to be here, you know, to have uh, Professor Jairaman Valeri, sir, mentor, uh, above all, a wonderful uh, medical leader, and an eminent scientist of uh, repute with respect to uh, machine learning and deep learning, uh, most importantly, uh, the heydays of his particular research when he carried out on uh, something like phenomenological model. That was uh, how uh, his particular research has been. I happened to meet him in uh, 2008, uh, where I had a short stint at CDAC Pune. And uh, that was uh, when I uh, happened to meet in a very, uh, uh, in a very uh, eminical sense, where I was uh, uh, running out of blue where my thesis was submitted and I was just, you know, acclimatizing to uh, my conditions over there in a government lab. And that was how, you know, he pushed uh, uh, me, to, me to uh, take up some excellent science. Uh, he even asked me to move towards uh, research horizons where, you know, I'm more, you know, particularly focused. And that is how you know, I'm here today. Uh, but uh, uh, just to briefly introduce Sir. Sir is uh, uh, an undergraduate and postgraduate in uh, chemical engineering. Then he went on to do his uh, PhD uh, way back in 1981, when uh, more than uh, three fourths of uh, the current audience over here were not even born as well. So, and then he joined a scientist B at National Chemical Laboratory, uh, Pune where he uh, uh, retired as scientist G, uh, which is uh, equivalent to uh, the director. That was uh, way back in 2008, where he retired. And then he went on to join as a, a senior consultant and advisor for CDAC Pony. Uh, and later on, he also has been uh, uh, serving as a CSAR Emeritus uh, Professor both at the University of Pune and uh, currently also holds as a distinguished uh, professor emeritus at uh, Shivanathan University as well. And currently is at Frame University of Pune as well. So he has you know, wonderful um, affiliations to his credit. Uh, one of the most important things uh, uh, Sir's research has been as a chemical engineer is what we call it as phenomenological modeling. So phenomenological modeling is uh, that point where it is derived uh, from something called uh, the empirical relationships, where we try to derive, where we try to equate, you know, different uh, phenomena. And these particular empirical relationships need not uh, necessarily be consistent uh, uh, with the theory, you know, that is already promulgated. But you know, it can also be uh, uh, necessitated, you know, from other principles as well. So, in other, in other words. Phenomenological modeling is not necessarily derived you know, from the first code of principles you know, that are really derived. So uh, that was how he uh, started his field. And then uh, uh, his area of uh, research consists of three main components. 
the phenomenal, phenomenological modeling of chemical reactors, evolutionary and heuristic methods and applications of artificial intelligence in machine learning to bioinformatics, and, and of course, the chemically reacting systems. And then, uh, uh, then uh, that is how you know the beauty of this uh, the so called you know, big data has been. And uh, without wasting much of his time, I'm absolutely uh, uh, keen you know, to hear Sir's talk. He has received you know, more than uh, uh, 25 uh, awards to his credit. Uh, the, uh, one of the foremost awards that he received is the Hardell Award. He has over uh, 110 papers to his credit, which is you know, quite amazing. And uh, uh, what I really learned from Sir over the last uh, uh, one decade is uh, you know, how to be uh, modest, how to be down to earth, and how to accept uh, what uh, life is and what and how you know, the research would really take us through. We'll have you now several Q&A session after his talk. So over to you, sir. Thank you so much, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prash. Are, are you, am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Prash, and a wonderful audience. Uh, and uh, I was actually trying to give him excuse, excuses for not uh, for the past one month. He has been asking me to give the science version excuses, correct and wrong excuses also. So somehow finally he caught me, and I am here. I am terribly scared of uh, presenting my journey, but still, I will try to show that to you what I have done in the past. Uh, yeah. Mm. Is this uh, are you able to see this? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. My journey so far. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So the personal details I'll start with, although it will be a little boring. So my dad was a professor of physics at St. Joseph's College, Trichiropoli. And he also studied in the same college. Uh, Jane Ramachandran was his classmate. My schooling was in ERI school and St. Joseph's High School, Trichy, the Rock City. Pre-degree also I did at St. Joseph's College, Trichy. So this is a view of Rockwood and Kaveri which I was looking at every day for, for about 16 years in my childhood. Yeah. I did my B.Tech in Coimbatore Institute of Technology, 1965 to 70. After that, I was struggling for a job for about a year. Then I joined CSI Paper and Boards Limited, E-Road, as a chemical engineer. I worked there in the pulp mill for about two years. Two years and a lot of chlorine later, I thought I must do some uh, higher studies. So I joined MTech at University of Madras, Chennai between 1973 to 75. I did that at Chennai. So after that, I joined in Toshniwal in Chennai as a sales engineer. In about 15 days, I thought that's not my forte. So I left the job and joined Sikri Karekudi. And yeah, I think, uh, right. So before uh, that, I must say that 
I at M Tech in University of Madras. I had good teachers with positive attitude, excellent teaching skills. Had good food in the hostels. University of Madras as an environment. I had yeah. professors at good teachers with positive Chennai, attitude, yes, Ladha, excellent teaching skills. skills. Jagannath Swami. Lakshman had good food in the Lakshman. hostels. Professor Mohan and Chennai Kesman gave me excellent teaching in different aspects of chemical engineering. The computer center was nearby. Although we didn't have a course in programming, the computer center, which was originally started by JNR, was there in the college campus itself. JNR had left about a year or back before I joined, I think two years back. And then at that center, I had a computer available. So that gave me a chance to learn computing. And then I used to go and submit a few programs there and learn computing. So punch cards and submit and wait. That was itself a very thrilling, this thing experience for me at 1975. And not many people have heard about computers. Yeah. I had mass transfer as a specialization in my chemical engineering. Now, mass transfer is uh, one of the unit operations, very useful in several various processes, including biotechnological processes. Yeah. This. Uh, in bioreactors, the dissolved oxygen concentration. How do you uh, how do you make the mixing in the reactor so that your dissolved oxygen concentration is uh, kept in a particular level? Comes from how effectively you transfer mass through equipments. Yeah. Then after my MTech, uh, as I told, I joined Toshni Walls for 15 minutes. I left uh, 15 days and I left that job. Then I joined. Central Electrochemical Research Institute, Karekudi. I worked there for eight months. After that, I got a chance to uh, join National Chemical Laboratory, a premier national institute of eminence from that time till now. Here again, I had good teachers with positive attitude and excellent skills. Yeah. Here, at NCL, I was working from 1976, August to April 2009. Joined as a senior scientific assistant. I was asked to wait for about three years uh, by Dr. L.K. Swami, who was the then head of the um, Chemical Engineering and Process Development Division. So I did three years of process development and wind scale and pilot expand uh, experiments, drinking more chlorine. and I had a good hostel mate in Dr. B.D. Kulkarni, who was from LIT in Nagpur. He was my friend, philosopher, and guide. He had a major influence in my life. He is a thinker and broad-minded person. I used, I, uh, he was a very good student of Professor uh, Dureswami. He completed his PhD in 1979. And I, I, when I looked at him, I thought I must do a PhD uh, under Dr. Dureswami and also take the help of BDK. He cajoled LKD to take me under his guidance. He was kind enough to co-guide me with Professor LKD. And my P PhD work was in studies in catalytic reactions and reactors. I had a lifelong association with BDK until his uh, untimely death in November 2019. These are my mentors at NCL. Professor Duresan was later director of NCL and also worked in Iowa State University as a distinguished professor of eminence for about uh, 20 years yeah. after leaving NCL. Yeah. yeah. Coming back to a little bit of uh, the research work I have done. Um, I my research work, as uh, Prashant told in the beginning, consists of uh, three different uh, aspects. One is uh, phenomenological and first principle modeling in chemical reactions in reactors, multiplicity and stability in catalytic reactions in reactors. During this period, 
I also did from 1986 modeling of bioreactions in reactors in a small way. So during this time, I worked on diverse type of reactors, catalytic, non-catalytic, slurry reactors, liquid phase reactors, gas phase reactors, and multi-phase reactors. We tried to obtain analytical and numerical solutions, and then we got several novel solution methodologies, which was quite novel at that time. Let me show a uh, little more of that. Yeah. Mm. Is this uh, are you able to see this? We can see, sir. Phenomenological modeling of chemical and bioreactors. Yeah, we can see, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So the phenomenological and modeling of chemical and bioreactors uh, and the first principle models. We have two different types of modeling techniques, uh, which includes first principle and data driven modeling. And the third one is a hybrid approach, which combines both the first principle and data driven modeling. The first principle models are based soundly, very rigorously on conservation of mass, energy and momentum. You can get analytical solutions relating the key features of the system to its dynamic behavior. You can get closed form solutions, which is elegant, simple, and easy to use. So with the, the complexity of the problem increases with the increase in additional attributes and features, and then uh, rigorousness. So it takes a long, it is difficult to build phenomenological models for such certain situations takes time to build them yeah in phenomenological modeling modeling we did uh, more we did work on different types of reactors which include homogeneous heterogeneous fixed but fluid but etc several types of reactors we did simple models and complex models we uh, derived and then found out Analytical as well as sometimes we needed we needed to get anal um, numerical solutions. We also got numerical solutions for them. Uh, in heterogeneous catalytic reactors, uh, we, as I said, we tried with the different types of uh, reactors. The fluid reactor in which uh, the bed is in a fluidized state, so that can be an intimate uh, transfer of mass from gas to the solid. Uh, and uh, this can affect a very good mass transfer and you can get a good efficiency of the equipment but the modeling is quite tough and model we built a simple first level phenological model which was working at that time i'll come back to this a little later on this yeah we also modeled as i said with different types of reactors yeah there are several steps in the catalytic reaction now in the catalytic reaction from the the gas from the bulk phase it has to get adsorbed onto a boundary layer from there it has to uh, adsorb onto the catalyst surface then it has to diffuse by pore diffusion and then again dissolve back through the film to the boundary so there are several steps involved in this and each step in gives you a rigorous addition to uh, modeling steps and then a combination of this certain resistances if they uh, are controlling you can leave out other resistances the problem becomes simpler but when all the resistances are controlling which can be a case in real life uh, reactors the modeling becomes a little tough and the equations become very unwieldy we try to solve several problems in these uh, catalytic reactions yeah. we also 
provided uh, uh, solutions uh, for uh, catalysts which are micro and macro porous so when we are compacting uh, a solid into pellets where the solids themselves are porous this type of micro macro porous structure evolves and this introduces additional complexities and we got additional and we got the elegant numerical and analytical solutions for these situations also some of the papers early papers we had in 1981 on this and most of the phenomenological and the first principle models we uh, we did and we published in very good journals and nowadays these journals have a minimum of five to six of uh, impact factor yeah yeah i need to switch between here and there uh, sorry for that yeah all right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. <clears throat> So in 1980, after 1984, I did one year of uh, postdoc at Sunny Buffalo, and very cold place. And that year it was really cold. It never came back from negative to positive uh, temperature. Professor Vladimir Lavachek, uh, World Authority in Numerical Solution of Chemically Reacting Systems, was my guide. We worked on gas solid non catalytic reactions, essentially high temperature synthesis of. Uh, um, rocket fuel material so we simulated they did only simulations no experimental work yeah yeah after that uh, there was some paradigm change in uh, 1986 professor sp modak of pune university zoology department he started the msc biotechnology program in his department professor kulaskar and professor sita ramam joined the biotechnology department that time only and they were both in the hyderabad in uh, uh, hyderabad lab in i think it was ccmb yeah so professor wag who was later uh, a director of the national facility for national facility for animal tissue culture was also uh, one of the uh, program coordinators in that particular program so there are essentially five different, uh, uh, four different schemes. Uh, one was animal tissue culture. Second was plant tissue culture. The third was molecular biology. And the fourth was biochemical engineering. Animal tissue culture and molecular biology were taught at the University of Pune itself in the zoology department. Whereas plant tissue culture, culture and biochemical engineering were taught at the NCL. With Dr. Nene, I conducted the entire course at NCL for the MSc Biotechnology program for the Biochemical Engineering stream. It was happening till 1993. That time only, I learned and taught bioreactor design and enzyme kinetics. We did some research too. I have to go back. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So due to my association at the biochemical engineering curriculum of the Pune University, I did publish some a few papers. A simple method of solution of a class of bioreaction diffusion problems, the solution of hollow fiber bioreactor design equations, and yeah, and a few other papers also were published during that period. It would not have happened without my uh, teaching at the biochemical engineering program at the Pune University. I, I should must thank Dr. Modak for inducting me into that course. Somehow in 1993, I felt it was too heavy to do my research as well as teach the entire program. So I backed out of it in Yeah, so uh, again, there is another paradigm change. Yeah. It happened in uh, 1998. It was a class that started by Informatics Center at Pune University. So, um, 1998 till date, uh, I'm teaching at the Center of Bioinformatics. Uh, Professor Kulaskar, Professor Indra Ghosh, Professor Urmila, and Professor Sangeeta Savant have given me a, an excellent treatment at, uh, at the Bioinformatics Center. I am very thankful to all of them. So initially, I taught enzyme kinetics and numerical methods. And I learned some bioinformatics and computational biology, whether it is supervised or unsupervised learning. I think you guys must uh, uh, guess on that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Let me go to the second area in which uh, I worked. Uh, the second area I worked was uh, catalytic multiplicity and stability of uh, chemically reacting systems. So in that, uh, in chemically reacting systems and biochemical reacting systems, certain reactions, even certain enzymatic reactions with uh, inhibition can have multiple steady states. So the when you have multiple steady states, it can give you a solution which is uh, the best possible solution which gives you the highest yield. Or it can go, depending upon the operating conditions, it can go to a solution which is uh, gives you the lowest possible yield. Or it can oscillate. In chemical reactors, in exothermic reactions, adiabatic exo exothermic reactions the reaction can even go to a runaway and so, so we need to model this uh, multiplicity and stability of reactors uh, taking into account the phenomenology as well as nowadays people use numerical methods also to effectively find out the system parameters which can lead to uh, the lowest possible yield or highest possible yield or which can lead to a runaway uh, reaction conditions. So we did some work on that during 1982, 1981 to 1994. And then we also published quite a number of papers in good journals on this in this area, exciting area. Recently, we also uh, applied chaos for solving uh, 
evolutionary computing problems for selection of attributes, important attributes in bioreacting systems. Yeah. The next area of work I did was uh, essentially started at uh, uh, 2000, in the year 2000, wherein we started to switch to uh, from phenomenology to data-driven modeling systems. So we we employed various data-driven modeling paradigms, which include support vector machines, random forests, and ensemble of reactors and different uh, ensemble of uh, uh, machine learning models. And then we tried to use them in initially with the several chemically reacting system problems. So later on, we applied that to protein function identification annotations and other problems. But we started this work essentially with the, um, chemically reacting systems. Let me share those slides with you now. Yeah. Prash, so you want to ask questions now a little bit, and then we'll again go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, no, sir. You may, you, you may please go ahead, please. Yeah. I can go please. ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Is it visible? Artificial. Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Because I asked this because many times. Uh, I'm not good in this sort of things. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, see, the goal of data driven modeling is to build a system that can adapt and learn from experimental data. As I said, to work with data driven modeling, it requires a large amount of data. Using domain knowledge, you must, with different parameters and uh, with large ranges of different variables you must have experimental data available to fit in uh, data to build a model and the model can be used for newer situations and then as we as we talk about in protein function identification build models with the known historical sequences protein sequences for a known function and use that model to find out the function of the query sequence the same thing is uh, valid for any uh, domain, yeah, which includes chemical engineering, yeah. So we have a set of input attributes or variables which we extract from the domain information. These attributes have to be most informative and then build the data and then find out the output as a function of input with the data-driven modeling paradigm. Once this is done, for any given new value of the input attributes, you can find out the outputs. Yeah. So we worked with the SVM, and we were the among the first to introduce support vector machines uh, in chemical engineering system. In 2000, we published a very small uh, note in chemical engineering progress. I think that was the first uh, um, uh, paper published in chemical engineering and SVM. Although SVM is very rigorously derived from statistical learning theory by Wapnick, and then SVM can recognize patterns very efficiently and can solve problems in very elegantly in different areas of science and engineering. So after 2000, you can see several uh, papers have employed SVM for building models in different domains of engineering and science. Yeah. I will not go into the details of that. What SVM does is given a set of attributes, given a, given a problem, you get the set of attributes for different classes and then build a model again for query 
signals or query sequences, you send them across the model and then it will tell you whether it belongs to a particular function or another function. Okay. Here we talked about signals which are normal and abnormal signals in chemically reacting systems. There can be signals which can uh, abnormal, suddenly you can get uh, abnormal operating conditions of reactors. So extracting the time series signals uh, of normal and abnormal sequences which are available from historical data, you can build a model and the model can be used to identify whether a new signal is going to be normal or abnormal. Yeah. So essentially it was used for fault detection by us for some problems. Yeah. So SVM employs a linear maximum margin hyperplane which maximizes the distance between the closest points belonging to two different classes. For examples which are not linearly classifiable, it takes the data to a high dimensional feature space and uses a linear uh, classifier in that space. But to which dimension we have to take and which is difficult to identify. So, and the problem becomes uh, intractable because you try to take it to different, uh, you use some uh, uh, function to take it to a high dimensional attribute space and then try if it's not working you have to try one by one to simplify the problem Wapnik et al employed kernel functions so by using kernel functions all the computations can be done in the original space itself so svm is a linear classifier in the high dimensional attribute space and by virtue of using kernel functions all the computations can be done in the original space itself yeah. We worked at SVM on several problems. Uh, we did regime identification of reactors, fault detection. We also classified biomedical signals and identified genes. So to explain how did I identify genes, I have to go back to a story again. Sorry for going back here and there. Yeah. Next time, I'll make a better set of uh, PPTs so that I need not go zigzag here and there. Hmm. Yeah, right. In, so, uh, so my journey into the bioinformatics started with uh, joining the bioinformatics department and teaching them. I initially started teaching them only enzyme genetics and numerical methods, but later, just by listening to other people and talking to various faculties in the bioinformatics department, I learned some bioinformatics and computational biology a little bit, and that knowledge has not increased even today. So I'm trying to learn more and more of bioinformatics and computational biology with the help of uh, uh, friends like uh, Prash. Yeah. In 2004, a student from PhD Tech by technology department, he, he was not scared of joining with me as an intern. And then he said, I, please give me a bioinformatics problem. So I asked him to choose his own bioinformatics problem. Gene identification was his choice. So he formulated the problem very well. Then I will come back to that uh, with the set of other slides now. In 2006, no, K. Krishna Kumar from PhD Technology came as an intern again. And he again helped me in my journey into bioinformatics domain. And Piyush Mundra, a project assistant, uh, he also joined uh, in this, around the same time. So these are the three guys who are responsible along with the bioinformatics department of Pune University, uh, helping me to uh, go into the uh, venture into the bioinformatics domain. Yeah. So while I was teaching at uh, Pune University, Professor Balaji also used to teach, even now he comes, a few lectures. He used to come all the way from Mumbai by taxi and come to the Pune University and teach. 
So uh, we used to talk together uh, whenever he used to come and uh, I explained him about SVM. He was very curious about SVM. He wanted to learn about SVM. So we taught him about SVM. So he went and he had his uh, PhD student, uh, Susan Edicola Thomas. So both of them came back to me with a problem. So a few visits uh, of Balaji and Susan to Pune and uh, myself and my student Abhijit Kulkani to Mumbai. Uh, we were uh, ready with the problem statement. And Dr. Vignesh is currently assistant professor, still a collaborator, and Krishna Kumar is in a very uh, uh, big uh, German company as a director at Germany now. Yeah. Now I'll go back uh, what we did with these people and with Professor Balaji and then show now. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, we had uh, solved a few problems of time series signals and gene identification. We we took the gene identification problem as a time series. Yeah. So you know, normal and sinus uh, based rhythms we. So reactor pressure signals, you know, in, during the course of the reactor in, uh, operation, the pressure fluctuation. So the reactor has different regimes of operation. So in each regime, the, the, in the reactor, the gas liquid comes and then gas and liquid bubbles uh, uh, intimately get mixed or do not get mixed properly, depending upon the regime of operation. And then, uh, so we used a... This was done by Professor Ranade and his student. They extracted the pressure signals during the course of the reaction. It's a time series signal. This signal we used and we extracted the most informative features and used them to identify the regimes of operation, inputting those extracted informative features into SVM and then built a model. Yeah. Uh, we also used uh, mm, for the gene identification problem. Uh, we took prokaryotic prokaryotic genes, and then the gene sequences were treated as time series. So a real life time series uh, would have uh, at certain at certain cases. So for for the uh, time series sequences, you can see the pressure signals. No. At some at some positions, uh, it it doesn't uh, jump from one value to another. It is at some positions it is very normal, and then it doesn't have any fluctuations. At other some positions, it moves from suddenly it jumps from one value to another value. There is a strong jump. So if you can uh, characterize the normal and jumping signals, we can use these char characterized uh, attributes as informative features. Now, by the, by itself, the time series signal taken around a small five minute, five seconds, it's large amount of data and it by itself, it, it is redundant. You cannot extract any information. So you need to extract the most informative attributes. For the gene sequence, again, we used ATGCs. We gave numbers. We gave numbers from one to four, and that was uh, permuted. If A was given one, one to T was given two, G was given three, C was given four. We also changed this, permuted this, and then tried to use them. Those again showed this sort of uh, behavior. Suddenly, if A to C is there, it may jump from if A and A occur together uh, for a certain period of time, then there may not be a large change in the signal. So, using this, we evaluated the singularity from the wavelet spectrum. So it's difficult, as I said, to characterize the raw time series data. We extracted the most informative attributes. We employed wavelet transformation and classified the extracted attributes with SVM. So again, from the wavelet transformations, uh, we got uh, uh, 
most informative attributes uh, in, in terms of the uh, holder exponents. So, and use those exponents as input attributes. Yeah. So, the, well, from the time domain to wavelet domain transfer, and it, you can see from this, you can extract the most informative attributes. And then that those were used as input to the SVM. Yeah. So the regularity and irregularity itself uh, provides a unique signature, and the signature uh, changes from in a given sequence whether it is going to be uh, a protein coding or not non coding region. Yeah. Similarly, for uh, regime identification of reactors and also for normal and abnormal reactor operations. So, the same time series uh, signal can be used in different domains, and the same methodology can be used. We did uh, this three different uh, things, and then published papers on that. Yeah. We also worked with several chemically reacting systems. Uh, on SVM, we extracted the future extract and denoised using some kernel principal component analysis. Did some analysis uh, on kinematic dynamical systems. And then we also did SVM classifier, used symbolization SVM for handling noisy data. And We'll come back to this. <clears throat> Some problems uh, in bioinformatics and computational biology we handle, I will just show that. Yeah. We did uh, a lot, uh, large number of protein function identification problems using SVM and uh, random forest and a few other models. Yeah. So, uh, so to get the useful model for function identification, you must be able to extract the right type of attributes. For that, what you can do is you can extract the available attributes, both sequence as well as structural. Use a compendium of features and use domain knowledge coupled with attribute selection methodologies and then use the most uh, informative attributes in your final models. So these are some of the attributes you, you can use. Yeah. We uh, applied that uh, for protein subnuclear nuclearization. Yeah. Uh, as you know, nuclear compartment uh, participating related pathways are concentrated in specific areas. So mislocalization uh, can have uh, um, uh, a lot of say in Genetic disease and diseases and cancer correlates with the dysfunction. So yeah, at, we use us uh, we use some simple attributes like pseudo amino acid composition and dipeptide and physical physical chemical attributes. And then we had is a multi class problem and then we had to identify with the data sets the multi class problem and build model with SVM with these properties and then we could, could we got good results. So this work was done with Professor Balaji and his student at IIT. So, so on our expression in East, you know, whatever you get, uh, you may get uh, soluble or insoluble proteins. Mm, yeah. So we need to, for the sequence to be useful, 
we, it has to be soluble form. So the identification of solubility of uh, propensity of protein to be soluble or inclusion body over expression over expression in uh, E. coli is a very important problem which we tackled in 2007. We used uh, different attributes, different reduced alphabet attributes. The alphabets can be reduced depend and the 20 letter alphabet can be reduced in terms of uh, a few few of a few physical chemical properties this alphabet reduction uh, enables not only reduction in attributes it also enables uh, simpler models and uh, an easier domain information you get so we used a few reduced alphabet uh, methodology um, attributes physical chemical properties along with the traditional attributes of amino acid dipeptide and tripeptide so we, we use individual attributes and hybrid modules were also used. So these were the physiochemical properties used. And uh, we found out the hybrid model performs quite well. That particular work we did with uh, Professor Balaji paved the way for me to understand bioinformatics, the nuances of bioinformatics. And then I really thank Professor Balaji and his student, uh, Susan. I went on to work with uh, Susan again in around 2010 i'll come back to that now yeah. yeah we also did some attribute selection and we found out the best attributes after selection of attributes it gave an accuracy of 70 percent which was uh, that time was found to be quite good for this particular problem yeah yeah so the role of primary structure of proteins on the antimicrobial activity so prediction of uh, sequences which which are antimicrobial which have antimicrobial activity or which do not have antimicrobial activity so the prediction of the function of amp is what we did with uh, susan thomas uh, who is now currently a scientist in narrh uh, mumbai so he, she was a student of uh, professor balaji with whom we already did the work that work was published in uh, bioinformatics the Journal of Oxford Bioinformatics, yeah. And so, even that gene prediction work with, with a student from uh, an MSc student from uh, PhD Tech, uh, we, we managed to publish in Bioinformatics because of the quality of the student they had, yeah. Similarly, uh, Mr. Suman, Susan Thomas also was also very good and she also grasped the SVM fundamentals, and she is now writing papers on, on her own with a group of people on, on uh, machine learning aspects of uh, bioinformatics. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a set of uh, um, positive and negative sequences, used a few properties like polarity, charge, resonance, and structure. And then we built, a, we built a model. The model was quite good. It predicted more than 80 percent accuracy so we also uh, the database building was done by susan i was only instrumental in helping her in doing the modeling for uh, amp prediction yeah so uh, so uh, that is a and AM, AMP is a very well-known uh, AMP prediction server which is available. Uh, now there are more versions on that. So we had uh, three versions. I was I worked only in the first version. Later on, she, as I said, she herself is able to contribute, and then she has published uh, structure. Uh, so we did work on a sequence with uh, modeling with sequences only. She also did work with uh, structural. Uh, attributes and then recently she has updated the database and then also the prediction server yeah so we also did some uh, identification ligand binding sites uh, using structural attributes different types of structural attributes we had used one of them were uh, we used the voxel based descriptors the voxel based descriptors are those descriptors uh, which uh, directly you can take the image as a voxel file so 
what is uh, pixel and 2d for 3d is known as a voxel take it to the zernike polynomial space so once you take it to the zernike polynomial space uh, uh, this uh, zernike polynomial space is uh, translational and rotational invariant so it has so it, uh, it is quite useful to take into the next space and then using the neck polynomials you can get uh, the Zernike descriptors from a set of uh, image you can get structure from the structure you can get a set of descriptors these descriptors you can use as input to the svm and then and then build a model so we did this with the uh, for certain leon binding uh, functions yeah so essentially, you have to extract the surface pockets, represent the local surface in image format, localize the surface, transform it into 3D the next space, compute the descriptors, build an SVM model, and then analyze. So this was the actually the, this uh, this was uh, camp, no? So yeah, sorry for this, yeah. So this came uh, after uh, the earlier slide. I'm sorry about it. So the camp is uh, with, this was published in NAR. Yeah. Right. I'll, I need to stop sharing and come back. Yeah. We also worked in uh, wait. in evolutionary computing, which is another area. I will very show you a small glimpse of that so that uh, you can have some understanding what what we did there. Yeah. yeah. Screen is visible now. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we worked with uh, some intelligence methods like and colony optimization, intelligent water drop algorithms, Firefly algorithm, uh, simulator nailing, biodiversity based methods, and group search optimizers. And recently with uh, black hole methodologies all of them uh, use some evolutionary heuristic methods based on and genetic algorithms of course based on the certain uh, natural nature inspired methods you can use this nature inspired methods for solving some problems essentially we use this uh, for attribute selection mainly yeah we also did for a few other problems uh, uh, in chemical engineering for optimization of chemical processes and optimization of large scale reactors and and for the media optimization like that we did in chemical engineering yeah in, so and colony i will very quickly i think if, if many of you heard about aco this thing so so uh, so and colony is uh, is inspired by the corporate research behavior of uh, real life fans and so if you for if you for example if you Drop a little bit of sugar at home or office, you can see a highway of uh, ant forming. And this is mainly due to the that ants can, certain types of ants can deposit and then sense, uh, get attracted to the pheromone rich trail. So, this getting attracted, uh, uh, depositing pheromone and getting attracted to the pheromone rich trail uh, has been the main uh, mechanism for the almost blind ants for uh, optimizing their uh, route from the nest to the food source. And this has been used by computer scientists for solving different problems. Yeah. So that is the idea behind the hand colony. So they try to put a obstacle in a from nest to the foot source. So they found out again it uh, by creating two different paths, one shorter and another longer. They found out the short path again is very quickly gets uh, uh, gets in the steady state. Yeah. 
So we applied it to several different problems uh, in chemical engineering systems. We saw all this, uh, use this for dynamic optimization problems in feedback reactors, essentially. That's why I'm showing this. So to evolve the free flow rate, yeah, in batch reactors and catalyst pellets. So in the reactors, uh, the, so if you, uh, so the idea here is to, there should be only a particular, so in the feedback reactors, cells and all substrates, except in the rate limiting substrate is taken in the reactor and the rate limiting substrate is now fed into the reactor. Now that should be a feed policy. That means what by feed policy, what I mean is you must use a particular feed rate which varies with time. So what should be the feed rate during the entire period of uh, fed batch reactor operation so that you can maximize the production? That's the idea. Now you can we have used this so so this profiles. So what what we do is we start with a set of random initial profiles. Find out uh, with each profile, we find out the yield of uh, the product, and then these are your initial initially generated random solutions. So this this profile changes with time. So initially, the rate of uh, the sub rate limiting substitution is low; it goes high and then comes down, and again goes up. So that is one profile. Like that, you've got different profiles, and you have to maximize your yield. So that requires a particular profile throughout the batch time of operation, fed batch time of operation. So with this, using the principles of ant colony, we try to get better and better solutions with iterations by using the pheromone mediated search as the heuristics, we found out best possible solutions. And then this was the optimal feed rate, the best, um, sorry, what else? yeah. That's the possible feed rate we got for the problem. We solved the many different problems for dynamic optimization using ACO. And <laughs> so there are different uh, heuristic methods we use. I will not go into the details because of lack of time. So we have uh, published a large amount of uh, uh, papers in this, uh, this thing. Including in bioinformatics, we have and also in quantitative structure relations. We employed this evolutionary computing methodologies as a tool for uh, finding out the most uh, informative attributes. Yeah. So these are the papers we published in these areas. Yeah. I'll come back. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, let me keep it here only so that everybody can understand. Yes. So to complete the story. So from 2006 till date, I am also visiting Center for Modeling and Simulation as a visiting faculty. It should be 2015, 2020. I, I was an adjunct professor, January. And then currently I'm continuing as a visiting faculty. From May 2009 to October 2004, I was working as a consultant and emeritus scientist and again consultant. I had a good fortune of interviewing one gentleman of uh, Joshi's group. I will come back to that uh, towards the end of it. Now, V. Sundar Rajan, a senior scientist, a well respected CDAC, academia, and industry, was kind enough to inject me in the evolutionary computing group, and without whose help uh, I would have retired in 2009. I'm still continuing, it's mainly because of this gentleman. From January 2013, he unfortunately expired in 2011, two years after my joining, around one and a half years after my joining. Still, people talk about him. 
and he was one of the nicest gentlemen around CDAC and then one of the best gems I encountered in my life. Yeah. <laughs> From January 2013 till date, I am visiting professor at Center for Informatics in Shivanagar. I am very thankful to Professor Rupamanjiri Ghosh, who was then heading Natural Sciences Division and currently she is the Vice Chancellor of uh, Shivanada University and Professor Sukumar, the time was the head of the department, is currently a professor of uh, chemistry there. Both of them continue to uh, support me and then and till date I am <coughs> visiting professor <coughs> due to the COVID situation only in the last year I didn't visit. They even wanted me to be there as a faculty, regular faculty because of uh, Delhi cold and the family situation, I decided against it. I was uh, working there 15 days a month, there and 15 days I came to Pune. This I was doing for about six months, which I found it difficult again due to some family situations. Yeah. Now, later I was visiting about uh, six times in a year, that reduced to four times and reduced to two times, and the, the last year I have not visited. So, hopefully, uh, by the end of the year, I may be able to visit uh, more often. To Shunara. And Professor Amut Sane, uh, who is also teaching at the Pune University, uh, is uh, from is a person who came from Yahoo, is a very well read person and well uh, appreciated person in the industry. He he was uh, teaching, uh, he is also teaching now at the Center for Modeling and Simulation, South Rivai Pune University. He told me, why, why don't you join Flame? Flame has just started a computer science. Uh, uh, course, so undergraduate course, which will be upgraded to postgraduate. So, yeah, so with his help, I joined there as a distinguished uh, professor at Clem University and still am working there. So, I went there from November 2009 to March 15th. After the because of the COVID situation, I am teaching from home, I am taking online classes there essentially for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning is one course I'm teaching. And computational modeling is another course I'm teaching. So I forgot to mention I have taught uh, several courses to different areas, different uh, uh, subjects in chemical engineering and also in bioinformatics uh, in uh, this in these universities. And Professor Sherry Patrick was kind enough to call me to Paris during 2012 briefly for about three months. I worked with him, and I still. Uh, uh, have contact with him. Yeah. So from 2010, I'm involved in BioClues. Uh, thanks, courtesy of uh, um, Prash, uh, Sundar, uh, Sundar Rajan, and uh, a host of other people who are still, uh, I don't know, what, say, what should I say, supporting me. Yeah. In my um, Journey with uh, by clues. Yeah. Yeah. This was uh, Sundar Rajan from CDAC. Yeah. So I edited a book uh, on applications of meta heuristics and process engineering with Professor Patrick Seary. We are again thinking of editing another book. I have to find time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> There's a lot more to stay, say, but I just see whether I have told everything currently. Maybe if I have not told something, I will mm, wait a minute. Yes. Wait. Okay, this is uh, taking us some time to come. Yeah, so you can start asking questions and uh, I will uh, share on final uh, figure uh, later. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, you know, for um, an absolutely uh, amazing presentation and uh, a very detailed introduction, a kind of full of a you know, learning experience. And uh, 
a scientist of your age, especially at the age of 72, uh, when you say that uh, your students are your friends, your mentees are your friends, and your collaborators uh, uh, say, I'm itna kuch am sikhe hain. Profile scientific acumen that you bestow. Uh, we are uh, deeply honored to have you, sir, you know, for this uh, wonderful civilization. So, uh, one thing that I always wanted to ask is, uh, when we talk about machine learning, uh, the kind of seriousness or the kind of impetus that the uh, student scientists or the young students uh, are trying to wrestle today uh, is suddenly lacking, uh, especially in areas of machine learning. Uh, although, uh, when I say machine learning, uh, it's more precisely towards you know the bioinformatics aided machine learning, not necessarily the data driven or uh, the other aspects of the deep learning approaches that the uh, uh, researchers are uh, uh, working on. Uh, I, I can sense that you know there's a lot of an artificial intelligence based research you know, that the students are taking up, but not really uh, or not precisely more towards bioinformatics based machine learning. What is that aspect lacking, sir? Uh, can you please uh, advise? Um, your question is why uh, bioinformatics students are not taking bioinformatics uh, oriented machine learning? Is this, yes, uh, is this a question? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There are several reasons. One is um, the faculty in essentially I am talking about India and yeah, the faculty in bioinformatics in India. They have not uh, tuned themselves with the recent developments in uh, bioinformatics, essentially in computational biology. And uh, I am not talking about experimentalists. I am talking about theoretical bioinformatics people who still think uh, database uh, is uh, bioinformatics. Now, they have to come out of that particular uh, uh, idea and the teachers have to learn and the universities have to appoint new people. And another thing is, as I told, the universities are still very rigid in India. In bioinformatics, they must be able to appoint uh, interdisciplinary uh, teachers and faculties. That is where you can uh, introduce machine learning personnel, and then that can give a little more impetus uh, for the introduction of machine learning in bioinformatics. That is one. Secondly, the students uh, themselves are not upgrading themselves to the latest situation. If you can see, the, the machine learning now derives its uh, strengths from different areas, which includes uh, artificial intelligence, which subsumes the machine learning, statistics, statistical learning theory, control theory, mathematics, physics, and essentially all domain areas of uh, biology. Now, if uh, you are not aware of uh, or you upgrade yourself to the latest in all these areas, it is difficult for you to work in machine learning. To work in machine learning, you today you will have one aspect of uh, problem coming from one domain or one subdomain. Tomorrow you will get another area and another subdomain. So students have to uh, have to upgrade themselves and then learn different areas. Uh, and sub areas and that is a little difficult thing because anything difficult people give up and that i think is the reason but the young, youngsters are now learning by themselves and then although it is not taught in the colleges and class i know uh, machine learning is not a part of curriculum in many major universities universities of repute also they don't teach uh, machine learning in bioinformatics and then uh, the curriculum change has to come in and then uh, yes yeah and that I think is the main reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very, very well inserted, sir. Uh, so, so, moving towards your scientific uh, uh, works, uh, uh, that that was a wonderful work with um, uh, Professor Balaji and others on uh, working towards the protein propensity and uh, other stuff. Uh, but, sir, if you really look into uh, the protein propensity, especially in bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, probably that may not really be that challenging when compared to the eukaryotes because in eukaryotes you have got about 16 organelles mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, in bacteria you hardly have about four or five organelles and you hardly discuss about uh, the organellar structure 
uh, to characterize a protein function. Uh, so, so is that is that uh, probably one of the reasons why probably algorithms like SVM uh, may have uh, a big uh, problem in uh, calculating the uh, accurate subcellular uh, location in eukaryotes when compared to the bacterial uh, uh, subcellular prediction. Uh, maybe, see, uh, maybe algorithm like is a uh, black box. You provide garbage in, it gives you garbage out. Right, so, go. Yeah. yeah. So, to provide a good input attributes, you need a good domain information. So, the, yeah. do, the domain information uh, from organelles, different organelles, uh, we have to get a, a little more detailed understanding of the mechanistics of the problem. Otherwise, if that is not possible, uh, uh, domain information cannot come. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, 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 the ant colony based uh, approaches, uh, if you really see, uh, there's a small variation that uh, we could uh, employ uh, uh, the ant colony based approaches, the bat algorithms. Uh, but, but if you really look into the gene, clusters or predicting the gene clusters uh, for uh, optimizing the number of genes towards setting in a kind of a function. Sensitivity is always uh, at risk. You don't get that kind of sensitivity when uh, calculating the uh, 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 gene function or predicting the genes. Uh, is it that, is that one of those particular reasons, sir? Uh, can, we, can, can we really uh, say that it's one of the reasons why uh, and these approaches are not preferentially used yeah. for yeah. It is not only the ant. As I said, no. To get the most informative attributes, you require a good domain information. Now, uh, maybe in the sort of examples you have, the examples may not be balanced because in cancer prediction, I think you have normal data, very large amount of data, and the other data, the people with cancer or any type of cancer, the number of data you have is very less. So that may be one reason your sensitivity is not good. Secondly, the attributes, in my opinion, the attributes you are you are getting may, may themselves may not be the complete biomarker information. Some of the attributes may interact with other genes and which is not evident in your machine learning algorithm. So, so that so what it means is you have to find out the gene gene interactions to identify what and then further these gene gene interactions which are selected with the machine learning with see one one particular genera see there, there there are multiple answers to the same problem the same ninety percent accuracy can be given by different subsets of attributes subsets of genes which is the best so the answer is we do not have a complete idea about the uh, the, the biomarker genes, the selected attribute need not be the complete biomarkers. So, 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 so we need to do, uh, or you also have to have this uh, SVM uh, re recursive cluster uh, algorithm used by use of uh, is uh, is another algorithm which can uh, provide a good idea of correlated genes coming together in a cluster which may not miss an information that might give a better sensitivity. But that also, SVM recurrence cluster elimination along with ant colony can give better uh, solution. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so in a nutshell, we may say that the feature selection plays a very important role uh, and selection of attributes and uh, making uh, an, uh, a, a kind of a coherent uh, training data set is also probably you know, very uh, very important in this case. Yeah, correct. Which is which is probably lacking uh, uh, in this particular case, especially uh, ascertaining the biological problems. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, sir, uh, moving further uh, uh, in the in 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 four or five years of uh, illustrious career, sir. Uh, uh, any chance of uh, disagreeing in an agreeable way with your colleagues? with senior colleagues or your junior colleagues, or even with your uh, students. And uh, if that were the case, you now how did you uh, disagree in an agreeable way? If you can uh, kindly tell the younger audience over here, 
because you know that will be a kind of a huge learning experience you know, for them. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. See, disagreeing to agree can occur in several situations. In my opinion, I have disagreed with my colleagues uh, on uh, several aspects of uh, uh, first principle models and then uh, uh, using machine learning models. Yeah. Now, many of the colleagues in chemical engineering um, curriculum have told me that uh, data driven models are useless. They cannot provide any information. That's not true. That's because uh, you can have a first principle model, and then more the say first principle models can work until certain extent. If more number of uh, interactions come, like you have got a many body problem, as many many interactions are coming, you do not have a complete understanding of the domain. When you do not have a complete understanding of the domain, that's why machine learning is uh, thriving in bioinformatics. Yeah. So you don't have a in complete rigorous understanding of the domain. You have to use uh, data. So if you have a large amount of data and taken uh, experiments in different uh, along uh, for widely varying ranges of uh, parameters, or if you have large historical data available, you can definitely build a model which is better than a phenomenological model. With this, we proved with the fluidized bed reactor in which the interactions of uh, the particles and the gas uh, is uh, very difficult to characterize and then we found out using the fudge parameters for a first principle model is worse than using a data driven model yeah yeah wonderful sir uh, sir uh, there are three important uh, uh, layers of uh, uh, the so called artificial intelligence of course artificial intelligence come under a bigger cloud as you rightly pointed out then comes the machine learning and then more preferentially the deep learning based approaches. Yeah. So uh, could you uh, could you see a kind of a, uh, uh, a correlation between the uh, methods that uh, or modeling, you know, that uh, yeah. uh, you were introduced to uh, during your early uh, phase of your career and yeah. uh, how that particular uh, uh, theoretical values have uh, theoretical first values have really steadfastly paced towards uh, uh, towards research and now if you really see these three layers also you know, building up uh, where, do, where do you see these uh, machine learning based approaches moving ahead yeah. sir, during the next decade yeah if you ask me this uh, recently a set of uh, scientists uh, uh, led by an indian uh, at the us i think it, uh, they have come out with uh, very fast paced solutions using deep learning neural networks along with uh, um, some time series, time series based method, I think, yeah, along with the method to solve the CFD equations of Navier-Stokes. So the partial differential equations for Navier-Stokes can be solved very quickly, thousand times faster than the normal way of doing it using deep learning methodologies. This again, deep learning can be used to solve uh, uh, first principle models is this this is one example the second example is again the Schrodinger's equation people are trying to use deep learning to solve Schrodinger's equations for different situations and that again I think uh, will be useful uh, in solving several problems including drug design problems yeah 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 wonderful sir uh, uh, sir, uh, again, at uh, some point of time, uh, as you know, you know being in uh, BioClose over the last uh, 12, 13 years, uh, your advisory role has been wonderful. Uh, and I think you know you have mentored more than um, several students, wonderful publications, and you have guided them, and all those kind of things. Uh, but you see the current generation, the current uh, 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 young minds, uh, do you think that the coding should be attempted right from the uh, from the school age so that you know they could probably enhance these skills so that you can as well bridge the gap yeah coding now uh, you see that there are coding uh, exercises being done from standard eight so uh, coding coding must definitely be introduced at an younger age although carefully 
Yeah, so people have to be careful about for which problems uh, you introduce coding. Introducing coding in a small way, right from standard 9 or 10, will be very useful. Before that, I am not very sure. And then uh, there are several um, coding uh, exercises given, uh, tutorials are given, including MIT coding for uh, uh, school students is there. And people have to cultivate coding because coding is going to be the way of life. No. Yeah. 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 So, uh, sir, one one final uh, scientific question towards uh, uh, something on the lines of your wonderful presentation. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, machine learning, of course, has uh, had its nuances in uh, bioinformatics. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when we really talk about the chemical engineers, they made a lot of attempt in understanding uh, uh, the bioinformatics, especially the molecular biology added uh, bioinformatics like uh, genetic engineering, uh, gene uh, interactions, protein interactions, protein function, and all those kind of uh, things. Uh, but but uh, but there must be at some point of time we need to combine chemoinformatics and bioinformatics as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the good old uh, chemical engineers could only navigate themselves more towards uh, biotechnology more towards uh, the so-called uh, uh, molecular bi biology aided bioinformatics but not towards understanding whether or not uh, 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 a, a particular uh, protein sequence can herald this structure and uh, this particular protein structure can give this, this so sequence structure function relationship is often given a miss by chemical engineers when compared to the so-called uh, bioinformatics and probably that's one of the reasons why chemoinformaticists, there are very many uh, chemoinformaticists, but not many of them are really from chemical engineering background. So uh, do, do, you see, uh, do you see any ray of hope uh, where we can have a mixture of chemical engineers and chemoinformaticists and bioinformaticists playing together in these uh, areas? So I have to uh, answer this question with a small joke. Yeah. The joke is a chemical engineer is somebody who can talk engineering to chemists and chemistry to engineers. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is not uh, altogether uh, a wrong statement. Sometimes chemical engineers are not uh, very well, uh, they study chemistry uh, more rigorously. That is the main reason for chemical engineers not able to contribute uh, in, in these areas where some fundamental chemistry knowledge is definitely a must. And in my opinion, uh, the, the the conventional areas in chemical engineering like mass transfer, heat transfer, and, and chemical reaction engineering, most of the problems have been what we call as beaten to death. So they have to move. So for their survival, they have to move towards this, and then this is happening. This is better than, the situation is much better than uh, before it's not as bad as what you are talking. Right, right, sir. Uh, so one one another gray area during the post-COVID times uh, that I can uh, think of is, sir, especially uh, development of complex pathway simulation models because you know this is accurate chemical engineering because a chemical engineer can better understand the birth of a cell as well. What happens in in a cell? Uh, what would be the uh, heuristic nature of that particular cell, what kind of metabolic pathways or uh, interactions a cell, might, a, a cell might entail and all those kind of things. So, I mean, it's just like an accelerating reactions that are occurring in a cell, in a, in a, in a native cell and taking that particular knowledge and predict what would happen if uh, a cell is uh, undergoing some uh, diffusion or if a cell is undergoing some kind of you know, chemical reactions in the future. Or a kind of a uh, COVID uh, virus-like infection prevailing in that particular cell. So this this particular thing probably is just beginning to be understood, and I can definitely see that a kind of a ray of hope is definitely seen uh, in um, understanding the the meta heuristic nature of uh, understanding the pathway simulations uh, using uh, using machine learning based approaches. Yeah. Right. So yeah, yeah please. Sir. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the metabolic flux analysis was uh, originally done by chemical engineers. Yeah. 
and if you can see there are a few chemical engineers in in India and abroad working on the flux analysis. Now the flux analysis, uh, so, so like for gene editing and uh, so these sort of things. Now what you must do is uh, it's a multiple um, objective optimization problem. You can turn it into. So you have to uh, edit genes in such a way the maximum reorganization of the flux uh, is uh, change is minimal, and also it must give you must be beneficial. So so this um, analyzing the flux uh, metabolic flux for uh, uh, under different situations and rearrangements uh, can be a good area, and then it is again uh, goes into that level. So multiple levels of scales multiple scale analysis is what is needed as you rightly say and these different scales will have uh, to move from one scale to another scale you have, there is some coerce graining done but uh, you have to have more rigorous models coming in yeah right, right. Yeah. yeah thank you sir um, uh, sir you wanted to show one more uh, slide uh, yeah, please sir, one more slide i asked a question that i interviewed one uh, one bright guy for an interview at uh, Dr. Joshi's uh, lab in around 2008 or 9, I think. Who is that person? You know? <laughs> no, I don't know, sir. It is none other than our great Prash. Yeah. <laughs> you do it, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I don't recall that, sir, but thank you very much, you know, for. Uh, uh, for uh, for being so kind, uh, I really learned a lot of things, uh, uh, you know, from you. Uh, you have been so kind. I always uh, draw emotions whenever you know uh, I talk to you. Uh, uh, even even now, talking to you is always a kind of a learning experience. I can I can always say uh, you're always more than a kind of a fatherly like figure. Uh, I I faintly recall somehow you know CDAC has not been that uh, fruitful for me. Uh, I just submitted my PhD thesis, but but I always drew positivity from you whenever I, I could I could I could uh, I could recall, and all your students have been absolutely amazing. I mean, the kind of mentoring that we could learn from you, they're always uh, they always shown success. They always have uh, 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 have been immensely successful. They took they, they took a wonderful uh, umbrella path from you. The kind of down to earth, there's a kind of a scientific equipment that you drop, the kind of uh, 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 sincerity that you drive, and the kind of trust that you bestow towards your mentees. That, that's that's quite amazing. We are absolutely very fortunate. I'm, I myself am really, very, very much fortunate that I've been associated with you since 2008. It's quite an amazing journey. And uh, I thank you for this great honor that you have really bestowed, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for the good words, and then I have few collaborators uh, in the alphabetical order. So, professors, some of them students have put it as wrongly as professors because of the lack of time. I prepared in last minute as usual. Yeah, professors, students. Yeah. So, I think some more students have become, I don't know, I'm sorry, it's not coming. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's, it, I think only this much. Yeah. So thanks a lot. And then finally, I would dedicate my journey to my parents and teachers and everyone. I wish uh, uh, best of luck and then very good career prospects for all in the back loose and uh, all young people and old people alike. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. So if you have one or two uh, quick uh, minutes, maybe uh, this mission can be open for a quick Q&A session from the yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah please. Uh, friends, do you have any quick questions, please? Uh, you can unmute and just quickly ask. Sir, no questions. We are just uh, um, like we were waiting for your talk so so long, uh, and uh, we are highly elated to listen from you. That's all, sir. And I just wanted to add only one thing. I am from Madurai, so we are from same geographical region. That's a, that's the thing. Thank that's you. It. Thank you. Yeah. That's Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, I think there's also a sheer coincidence as well. All the uh, three PhD fellows uh, who have joined uh, uh, in our group over the last uh, three years, they're they're all from uh, 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 Trichy, sir, including sure. Shani Rajopal and Narmada Shiva. Mm -hmm. So 
so i feel uh, always you know elated and uh, uh, feel very uh, happy i always take your reference first that jeraman sir is also from trichy and uh, and sir is this remain unto his expectations at, at least as a as, as a teacher yeah <laughs> yeah yeah thank you thank you so much sir so there are no questions uh, so friends uh, it's been a kind of an amazing journey uh, i can uh, uh, see that jagraman sir has spent more than 1 hour 40 minutes uh, he has had a lot of back ache uh, uh, over the last uh, one and a half two months he was almost bedridden and uh, this shows you know the kind of you no know, uh, sincerity towards his uh, this thing uh, he is uh, is just 72 years young Uh, but as you could see, is always uh, very dot on replying to the emails to any candidate, you know, uh, um, wherever he really wanted to help. And there are students like me uh, who, who is really who are really you know guzzling uh, wonderful science, who are doing probably good science. It's all because of his uh, uh, wonderful mentoring and uh, uh, blessings, I would say. And uh, we are really very much elated to have uh, Sir. For his wonderful scientific acumen, so I'm standing here and I give a kind of a standing ovation to Jeraman sir here for his wonderful talk today. And uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time and energy. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. So, friends, this is uh, civilization, the first civilization for this year. So we'll have uh, another couple of uh, civilizations uh, in February. 